EGEA initiative is a, it's an excellent initiative. I think it all gives us an opportunity to raise our game and to write factual and interesting stories that educate and entertain. Somewhere I read that uh, that is what journalism is about. Although of late, you know, you just hear negative stories. Uh, I've only been working for government for the last four months. And before joining government, if you just go by what is you read in the Kenyan paper, it's the last place you want to be because uh, nothing good ever happens there. But after I joined, and I know I shared this with the chief executives of the state corporations during a breakfast we had some time back, you, you can't imagine the kind of dedicated people, the hardworking and visionary people who work for the government. And sometimes they get beaten up so badly that uh, they stop believing in themselves, which would be very sad for all of us. The oil story in Kenya is, is young. We only discovered oil in uh, 2012, but the industry itself is more than 100 years old. And uh, lots of things have happened in those 100 years. I remember reading somewhere that when the oil industry began, there was no use for oil. It was a new product. People had been using uh, whale oil to heat lantern, to use lanterns for lighting. So there was no real requirement for crude oil. So they would just distill the kerosene and the rest of the product they would throw away. It was a serious environmental hazard. So in order to create um, a market, uh, John D. Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil, decided to give away kerosene lamps for free so that people could buy kerosene, which is not uh, too far-fetched from what I hear the oil industry wants to do subsidize uh, LPG cylinders to allow Mwanainchi to get into the, uh, a cleaner fuel. But I'm sure if you, <laughs> the next thing you'll hear is uh, the story will either go, uh, oil industry to, to help uh, least fortunate Mwanainchi get into, the, into a cleaner fuel from charcoal, from kerosene, from firewood. That's one way the story can go. Another way the story can go is government wastes money subsidizing cylinders. So the choice is up to you. You can decide how you want to write that story. So a lot of things have happened since 2012 or even during the exploration phase of oil in Kenya. When we started, nobody knew what oil and gas was beyond what you see in retail, petrol stations, now there are Kenyan companies who own equipment that move rigs, that uh, provide camps, that uh, provide things called cementing, the supply of uh, drilling muds, um, services, oil services companies, which 10 years ago, we didn't know what they were. In fact, we never even heard of them. If you look, I was reading the uh, Weatherford website the other day, and they had a rig in Kenya and of that rig, 80% of the crew were Kenyans, which is an incredible achievement that talks to the resilience and the innovation of the Kenyan youth. And these are young people. The other day I was in Cheptegat on the Talo, where Talo were drilling for oil. Um, and I met four engineers. I had lunch with four Kenyan engineers who were working on the rig and they'd been to all sorts of interesting places learning how to drill, how to get uh, the, 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 the cuttings to test whether there is oil present. It's amazing, again, for such a young industry. If you look at, um, if you go then to Turkana, now they, we have people from Turkana who are actually learning how to drill oil in other parts of the country. And I think, for me, I'm always interested in seeing young people do these things. Where you, as the journalists, can really play a very crucial part is when it comes to skills development. You know, we've been talking about the local content rule that's going to come in with a new petroleum bill. And one of the things that is most interested, you know, we tend to concentrate on local content as the supply of drilling rigs. Now, that's one. That's one thing. 
But the key thing for us as Kenyans and a young country where we have youth unemployment is local content in terms of skills development. And I know the people of TIVIT, the Ministry of Education, with the uh, technical universities, have been now trying to go back away from predominantly looking at engineering to now looking at um, welders, electricians, pipe fitters. There are so many jobs out there. We are soon going to build a crude oil pipeline. We will need people to do that work. We are currently building a products pipeline. If I tell you that there is a job in building a product pipeline that involves coating and the sealing of a pipe joint, and they are the, the majority of the people who are doing that right now in Kenya are Nigerians. We need to start telling the story that there is, that is TIVIT and vocational education is not a job you do when you couldn't get into university. It's actually a well-paying, uh, a dignified job. The good thing about it is it's portable. People are building pipelines everywhere in the world. These guys have come from Nigeria. Why aren't Kenyans in Gabon? Why aren't young people doing that in Kazakhstan, in the US? Welders, it will, it, will not, it will surprise you to know that we have three welders in this country, only three welders, who can weld what's called a tie line or a golden weld, three. The average age of these welders is 58 years old. So what happens when they retire in three years? This is a job for young people. And I think one of the most interesting things that's happening now in this country is that we are no longer going through the whole course of where we start training people from scratch, from zero. They know nothing about the industry, about being an electrician. And we then take them through two years of academic training, and then after that, we unleash them to the public. I think one of the things that TIVIT is doing, especially in this field, is going towards what's known as a competence-based training, where you may be have been wiring houses as an apprentice for the last three, four years. You do know something about electricity. And then you want to get into the oil and gas instrumentation and control. We find out what do you know and where your gaps are. And we train you for those gaps, which may take eight months, and then unleash you to the oil and gas industry. Today, if you look at countries like the Philippines, the Philippines is a TIVET country. They supply most of uh, the drillers. If you talk to uh, GDC, they'll tell you, talk to Kenjen. Today, if you want quickly to go and look for some drillers, whether it's geothermal, oil and gas, most likely they'll come from the Philippines. They have exported their people everywhere. While we are happy to do $1 billion in uh, diaspora remittances out of a population of 40 million people, the Philippines are doing $23 billion diaspora remittances in a population of 100 million people. That is pretty incredible. If we even just take proportionately, we should be doing at least $10 billion in remittances. That would change this economy. The other thing that, of course, that I would like to see reported is that recently, Tallow and Africa Oil uh, put money into oil and gas at Lodwa Polytechnic. I know none of you saw it because it was not in the newspaper. I happened to be in uh, Trukana the day before, and that's how I also got to hear about it. And of course, I interact with Talo and Africa Oil. You know, these are good news stories that we need to tell. Um, and also that people in Lod around Lodwa know that this opportunity is available to them. And it's not national government is coming, drilling your oil, and taking it to Lamu, and you'll never see it again, and you'll get no benefit for it. The other thing that um, recently we read in the paper is uh, my friend uh, Joe Nganga got a serious beating on product prices at the pump. Joe Nganga doesn't, I mean, uh, uh, Joe, Joe Nganga does not uh, make uh, oil prices. There is a publication every day called Platts. It's available to the public. You can follow it up, see what the oil prices are. And the way the oil prices work in Kenya is that there's a component of taxes, 
we obviously have to give our investors some profit, uh, the, the retailers, the wholesalers, who create jobs. We also have other charges that are there. And those ones make up maybe 50 shillings per liter. So what he was trying to tell you is that if crude prices or product prices went to zero, we would still be paying 50 shillings per liter. So what we should be concentrating is the other part beyond the 50. How have we done? Let me tell you how we have done. Kenya is one of the four most competitive countries in the world, in the world, for a non-producing country when it comes to pump prices. That's not me saying. There's a publication, international publication, that says that. It's available, again, in the public domain. We don't have to look very far. You know, the wonderful thing about oil and gas is everything is in the public domain. It's an international traded product. It's um, traded by airlines, by producers, by hedge funds, insurance companies, and those are the people that move the oil price. And for us to have a, a, a market that behaves like a market, it must be transparent. So when you ask these questions, or the public want to know about these things, it's all in the public domain. Even people call me, journalists call me all the time, and I tell them, everything I tell you is in the public domain. You can cross-check it. There is no reason for me to tell you a story because I know I'll get found out. At some stage, you will know about it. PIEA, um, I'd like to commend them because they also do training on journalism, uh, for journalists on some of the jargon. You know, some of us have been in this business for so long <clears throat> that we forget that there are people who are new in this business. And uh, we, like all industry, power is the same. Um, there's a jargon, you know? And if you're not in, uh, in that industry, you know, we tend to assume that everyone knows what we're talking about. Sometimes I even have to stop people and say, oh, what does that mean, you know? So again, you know, these are the sort of things that I think that you as journalists in, in, in Kenya, we have a story to tell. We have a story to tell, not ourselves only, but the outside world, that um, in the last four years, some very exciting things have been happening in Kenya and continue to happen in Kenya. You know, you've had all the initiatives, Kenya Pipeline Company, they are now going to take the pipeline to Mashinani. But they're not, they're, they want to spread the wealth. They're not just saying, well, we will build everything. No, they will build what, for them, we cannot finance through the commercial banks, which is the pipe. At the other end of that pipe, there are tanks. But those tanks, Wanainchi, um, local entrepreneurs, can finance the construction of those tanks and get a return. That way, creating a whole new industry. I know National Oil have been talking about the LPG initiative, and I uh, commend them, and I want them to go ahead and, and, and do that LPG initiative. And one of the things that's going to be very interesting when we start getting the LPG out to Monenji is that they're going to set up small filling plants. Rather than moving cylinders all over the place, they're going to start filling them there in your backyard in a safe way. Because right now, you know, there are all sorts of people who are filling cylinders in your estates. Uh, we try to police it. I know ERC have been chasing it, uh, PIEA. But these people are, like all illegal fillers, um, they're slippery. They move from one place to another. And once we, we, our aim is that once this thing starts happening in your neighborhoods um, and local industries are happening with young people, companies that are owned by, by women, they will be able to be the ears and eyes of ERC, uh, PIEA, the police, to stop these people stealing their livelihood and endangering the public. I think because oil and gas is an ongoing story and probably going to be one of the most exciting stories um, in the next coming uh, years, months and years, I think I'd just like to say that we as, at the ministry have an open door policy. If we don't know the answers, we can direct you to who has the answers. And we can also, working together with private sector, put together workshops for all of us, people who want to know what it is that's going on. And I encourage you, if there is, you, come, you hear something that we also need to know, please let us know about it. Let the public know about it. 
And this is what I want to leave you. These are my parting words for you. Let's work together to tell a credible story. If there is bad news, I don't have a problem with people telling bad news. Um, but if there's good news, let's also give the good news. Thank you. Allow me to acknowledge the, my colleague, the PS Petroleum, the chairman of uh, the various Parastatos, the CEOs, the members of the board, the, ma the management teams of the various organizations, and the most important cerebrant of today, that is the media. Uh, the fifth estate, or the fourth estate, as they call it. I indeed want to uh, thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, and take a very short time. I think a lot have been said. Uh, we need to launch, because that's what we came for. But uh, just before we do the launch, let me emphasize the importance of energy and petroleum in the society. We all know how important, how impactful these uh, two critical sources of enabling the economy